in the next version of the Adobe <laughs> book later. But the point is that control is built into the technology. Book sellers in 1760 had no conception of the power that you coders would give them someday in the future. And that control adds to this expansion of law. Law and technology produces together a kind of regulation of creativity we've not seen before, right? right? Because here, here's a simple copyright lesson. Law regulates copies. What's that mean? Well, before the internet, think of this as the world of all possible uses of a copyrighted work. Most of them are unregulated. Top talking about fair use. This is not fair use. This is unregulated uses. To read it is not a fair use. It's an unregulated use. To give it to someone is not a fair use. It's unregulated. To sell it, to sleep on top of it, right? to do any of these things with this text is unregulated. Now, in the center of this unregulated use, there's a small bit of stuff regulated by the copyright law. For example, publishing the book. That's regulated. And then within this small range of things regulated by copyright law, there's this tiny band before the internet of stuff we call fair use. Uses that otherwise would be regulated, but that the law says you can engage in without the permission of anybody else. So for example, quoting a text in another text, that's a copy, but it's still a fair use. That means the world was divided into three camps, not two. Unregulated uses. Regulated uses that were fair use and the quintessential copyright world. Three categories. Enter the internet. Every act is a copy, which means all of these unregulated uses disappear. Presumptively, everything you do on your machine, on the network, is a regulated use. And now it forces us into this tiny little category of arguing about, oh, what about the fair uses? What about the fair uses? Fair I would say the word, I'm not. To hell with the fair uses. What about the unregulated uses we had of culture before this massive expansion of control. Now, unregulated uses disappear. We argue about fair uses, and they find a way to remove fair use, right? Here's a familiar creature to many of you, right? The wonderful Sony Ibo pet, which you can teach to do all sorts of things. Somebody set up a wonderful set, ibopet.com site, to teach people how to hack their dog. Now, remember, <laughs> their dog. Right? And this site actually wanted to help you hack your dog to teach your dog to dance jazz. And remember, you know, Europeans are sometimes confused about this, but it's not a crime to dance jazz in the United States. Right? <laughs> this is a completely permissible activity, even for a dog to dance jazz. Georgia, there's a couple jurisdictions I'm not sure about, but <laughs> mainly dancing jazz is an okay activity. So Ibo Pet said, here, here's how to hack your dog to make it dance jazz, if anything would be a fair use of this piece of plastic that costs, costs over $1,500. You would think this is a fair use. Letter to the site. Your site contains information providing the means to circumvent IBO, wears copy protection protocol constituting a violation of the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA, even though the use is fair use. The use is not permitted under the law. Fair use erased by this combination of technological control and laws that say don't touch it leaving one thing left in this field that had three, control, copyright, controlling creativity. Now, never, here's the thing, you've got to remember, you've got to see this. This is the point, and the uh, world of Jack Valenti misses this. Here's the point, never has it been more controlled ever. Take the addition, the changes to copyright's term, take the changes to copyright scope, put it against the background of an extraordinarily concentrated uh, uh, structure of media, and you produce the fact that never in our history have fewer people controlled more of the evolution of our culture, never. Not even before the birth of free culture. Not in 1773 when copyrights were perpetual, because again, they only controlled printing. How many people had printers? You could do what you wanted with these works. Ordinary uses were completely unregulated. But today, your life is perpetually regulated in the world that you live in. It is controlled by the law. Here is the refrain 
creativity depends on stopping that control, they will always try to impose it. We are free to the extent we resist it, but we are increasingly not free. You, or the GNU, you can pick, build a world of transparent creativity. That's your job. This weird exception in the 21st century of an industry devoted to transparent creativity, free sharing of knowledge. It was not a choice in 1790. It was nature in 1790. You are rebuilding nature. This is what you do. You build a common base that other people can build upon. You make money, off, well, not enough, but some of you make money off of this. This is your enterprise. You create like it's 1790. That's your way of being. And you remind the rest of the world of what it was like when creativity and innovation was a process where people added to common knowledge in this battle between a proprietary structure and a free structure, you show the value of the free. And as announcements, uh, uh, such as Real Network's announcement, demonstrate, the free still captures the imagination of the most creative in this industry. But just for now. Just for now. Because... Just for now, free code threatens. And the threats turn against free code. Let's talk about software patents. There was a guy, Mr. Gates, who's brilliant, right? He's brilliant. He's a brilliant businessman. He has some insights. He's even a brilliant policymaker. Here's what he wrote about software patents. If people had understood how patents would be granted when most of today's ideas were invented and had taken out patents, the industry would be at a complete standstill today. Here's the first thing I'm sure you've read of Bill Gates, which you all 100% agree with. Right? Gates is right, absolutely right. Then we shift into the genius businessman. The solution is patenting as much as we can. A future startup with no patents of its own will be forced to pay whatever price the giants choose to impose. That price might be high. Established companies have an interest in excluding future competitors. Excluding future competitors. Now, it's been four years since this battle came on your radar screen in a way that people were upset about. Four years, and there has been tiny changes in this space. Of course, there's a bunch of Tim changes, right? Tim went out there and he set up something to attack um, uh, bad patents. That was fine. There was a bunch of Q. Todd Dickinson changes. He was the former head of the Patent Commission, never saw a patent he didn't like, but he, you know, he said some things to make some minor changes in how this process should work. But the field has been dominated by apologists for the status quo. Apologists who say, oh, we've always patented everything, therefore we should continue to patent this. People like Greg Aronian, who goes around and says, see, every single patent out there is idiotic, but turns out the patent system's wonderful and we should never reform it at all. Right? This is the world we live in now that produces this continued growth of software patents. And here's the question. What have you done about it? What have you done about it? Excluding future competitors, that's the slogan, right? And that company that gave birth to the slogan that I just cited has only ever used patents in a defensive way, but as Dan Gilmore has quoted, they've also said, look, the open source movement out there has got to realize that there are a lot of patents at stake. And don't imagine we won't use them when we must. 